We're going to spend time today uh, looking at Romans 9 to 11. Uh, Philip is going to spend time with us uh, handling God's word, explaining it and applying it to us. So we probably should get to know Philip a little. And uh, I've chosen a theme uh, to go with Philip, uh, but we'll use the letter F rather than PH. Come up the front, Philip. How about we make him welcome? Uh, There is nothing rehearsed or practised about this, and so we'll see how we go. Uh, Philip, you're here on your own, but you do have a family. Uh, Describe your family to us or tell us about who they are. Describe my family? Yeah, you can do that any way you want. I've got a wife. Her name is Amy. Uh, She's in um, Newtown right now, I suppose. Um, I've got a daughter who lives in North Carolina. She's been there, I think, 11 years, and uh, she's not coming back. And um, a son and his wife and my only grandchild live in, well, they're in Brisbane right now, but they are um, they bought a property just to the west of Brisbane, so they'll be moving. And um, I've got another son and daughter-in-law who moved to Notting Hill about two months ago, and so they'll be in London for who knows how long, hopefully not real long, uh, but they both have jobs there, and so that's good. And um, my youngest is still at home. He's doing an apprenticeship to be an electrician. Uh, Newtown, uh, family scattered all over the world, uh, a slight accent, uh, where are you from originally and how did you come to be in Australia? Yeah, okay, so I was born in Milwaukee, um, spent my school years there, and um, how did I come to Australia? Yeah. So, yeah, how much did I tell you why? So I grew up in a Brethren church environment, and uh, they'd been very supportive of us and very helpful over the years. And um, in 1995, I was looking for a job. I'd just finished my studies in the UK, and I was handed an application for a job in Sydney at a Brethren college. I thought, well, okay, I um, have to at least consider that. And it was sort of a missionary Bible teaching situation, and we applied not really knowing what we were signing up for, and that was a three-year commitment. Um, had a great time in Australia, but I felt like our time at that place had come to an end. And just then, Peter Jensen, who was a principal at Moore College, uh, rang me up and said, uh, would you like to come and teach at Moore? So we've been there since 1998. So just a slight tangent, does that mean you came to Australia as a missionary? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Have you ever met a missionary to Australia from another country? Uh, it's remarkable, but it also gives you a bit of an insight about Australia, doesn't it? that God's people in other parts of the world think we need missionaries at points. That's not quite true. Oh, listen, don't let, don't let the truth get in the way of my story, the, Philip. The, the, the missionary agency that sent us said, we don't consider Australia a missionary receiving country. We think of it as a sending country. So You're equipping uh, so, people to go. Yeah. 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 No, 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 my story is much better. I, it, it is, but it's not true, that's all. Uh, that, that was, did you watch a debate yesterday? <laughs> no, I was just asking. Um, so we've gone family, we've gone where you're from. Uh, you're coming to talk to us about God's word. We trust that you have faith in Jesus. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you came to know and love Jesus and something about following him that's either really terrific or really hard? So how did you come to have faith in Jesus, and what's it like to follow him? Just give us a snapshot. Well, I had the great privilege of growing up in a Christian home. My parents were uh, Christians, and on my mother's side, they'd been Christians for quite a long time. Um, So um, having that experience, in a sense, brings the truth into your life, and you see how it works out in action. And so in that sense, there's no dramatic story. It's just, you know, discovered the reality of it. Um, In terms of the challenge of faith, So when I went to study in seminary, um, I actually had a very difficult time with faith issues and had some real doubts that I had to work through. And so I wouldn't say faith is always easy for people. And I'm more and more inclined to think that it's not really a choice that we make because people do really struggle with it. And I definitely wanted to believe things that I just found very difficult to believe. So so doubt's been um, a part of that and something that I've had to deal with over the years. And when I say that, I discover um, a lot of people resonate with that, that that we have moments of of doubt. And there's no point in in denying that. Um, Hopefully we can be an encouragement to people as they go through difficult times. And I would say cling to the Lord um, and he'll cling to you. And that's been my experience. 
Uh, you've mentioned that you uh, work at Bible College, at Moore College. Uh, wh- what do you do full time? Like, what, what what do you spend your day doing, or lecturing in, or helping people understand? Yeah, most of the day is spent doing admin, uh, going to meetings, uh, but about an hour a day through the week, I get to teach classes, and obviously that's what's really thrilling, to uh, open the scriptures with people. I'm in the New Testament department, and so um, uh, this past term I would have taught Hebrews and John, and it's such a great joy to, to do that. And I've been doing those for a long time, and after a while you get to, you start to see things, discover things in them, so that, that's a real thrill. Isn't it good to learn that someone who's been lecturing in God's Word is still discovering new things? Uh, it's an encouragement. Uh, I had to come up, uh, I wanted five questions, so I had to come up with another F word, and I've chosen one close to my heart, food. Uh, tell us, uh, what, what would your, if, if you could have a meal, like last night's dinner was pretty reasonable, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, but if you could have a meal of your choice, uh, let's say the last meal, what, what would it be? I have no answer. You have no answer? You're not a foodie? I eat every day. You eat every day. Oh, I strike a lot. Ah, pragmatism, I love it, I love it. Well, Philip's going to come up later on and spend some time with us uh, looking at God's Word. Uh, at this point, um, uh, the Rose and, and Brent are going to take the kids next door and spend time with them looking at God's Word. And so if the kids would like to go with those guys and spend time next door looking at God's Word, that would be great. While they leave, why don't you make sure you've got your booklet. Uh, Turn with me to the very, very fulsome first outline on page four. What are you laughing at, Mr. Very? (laughs) It's a lot of space, uh, but I actually think it's a very good title. Uh, Let me just explain the outline. There is plenty of room there for you to write notes. And then down the bottom, at the end of each talk, we're going to have a moment on our own or with two or three others to reflect on three things. What's one thing new you've heard? What's one thing puzzling? And what's one thing to act on or pray about? And then at the end of maybe five or ten minutes together, uh, we'll come back and there'll be an opportunity to ask Philip any questions that you might have. Um, And that's the aim. Uh, Elizabeth's going to read to us uh, from Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And then after this, Philip will come up. Good morning, everyone. Open up. If you've got the church Bibles, it's 1003. And it's Romans 9 in everyone's Bible. All right, Romans chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. The ancestors are theirs, and from them, by physical descent, came the Christ, who is God over all, praised forever. Amen. Now, it is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Neither are all of Abraham's children his descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise are considered to be the offspring. For this is the statement of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only that, but Rebecca conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. For though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls, she was told The older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. What should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, 
I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, so that I may display my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. You will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay? to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honour and another for dishonour. And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory on us, the ones he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As it also says in Hosea, I will call not my people my people, and she who is unloved, beloved. And it will be in the place where they were told you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. But Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of Israelites is like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved, since the Lord will execute his sentence completely and decisively on the earth. And just as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. What shall we say then? Gentiles, who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over, and the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for reading that. Isn't it a blessing to hear the scriptures read so well? Um. Let me just say good morning. It really is a privilege to be here, and it was um, uh, really beautiful to uh, make my way to Narrabri yesterday on such a nice day and see the countryside, and uh, just absolutely lovely. Um, I want to talk about this uh, chapter. I asked it to be read because it's so long, I didn't want to have to read through it, and we'll we'll do that as we go along. Um, there are some incredible promises that God has made. And wasn't that song right as Bernard said? He keeps every promise and his word is true. What he is, he says, and what he says he'll do. And I'm feeling a bit of tension when I approach this discussion of Israel because, well, does he actually keep his promises? And I think that's something that we have to, uh, in a sense, take on board in our own lives. Is God reliable? Does he keep the promises that he's made? Um, can you point to promises that he hasn't kept? Maybe we need to qualify things a certain way. And life is full of promises. About 40 years ago, I stood in front of a church, and I was asked a question. I don't remember what the questions were, but I said, I will or I do, or something like that. And I was making promises, and I've kept those promises, uh, whatever they were. And, um, you know, my, my dad was... Um, um, a business owner, and he talked for quite a long time about when he retires, he's going to come and he's going to visit us in Australia. 
And he never used the word promise when he said that, but it was a hope that he held out to us, and I received as much as any promise ever made, I guess. But then he got sick, and he never got here. Uh, sometimes circumstances change. It isn't that he was being dishonest. Things just didn't work out. So what about God's promises? As we come to the book of Romans, first three chapters show us that everybody's guilty before God. Israel is guilty, but before that, let's say the Gentiles, all of humanity are shown to be guilty. Then the Jews are shown to be guilty so that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That truth comes through. And then we turn to chapter four and we discover that starting with Abraham, there's this incredible story of faith. And he pulls together Abraham and David to show us how um, God has uh, responded to his people in faith. And so that allows us to talk about salvation, a salvation based on faith, one that deals with sin. And um, the, the the argument of Romans unfolds that way. Uh, so we're now talking about the triumph of faith in chapter 5 and the new life that we have in Christ. And you say, hang on a second, I, I like this idea of a new life, but even as a Christian, I still struggle with sin. I still wrestle with sin, and I have this frustration in my life due to sin. And that's what chapter 7 talks about. And then we get to chapter 8, and there's an addition to, let's say, that life of sin. It's the Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit and the ability that the Spirit has to empower a life that's pleasing to God. Um, the Spirit groans as we groan, as creation groans. You have all this groaning going on, but the reality is that God has worked on our behalf to overcome sin, to free us from the power of sin, so that you can live a life which is pleasing to God. And you might be saying, well, not so much lately, but that's the way God has um, um, put us on this track on a life that's pleasing to God. And so we get to the end of chapter 8, and it says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth. He's covered everything. Nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is an extraordinary promise. God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. His love for us will never die. And I read that and I think, that's about as good a, a, a promise as anybody could ever offer. That God is on our side and will never leave us. And then Paul says, and there's no transition into this. Now we're at chapter 9. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. Without a transition, he's gone from God's love will never die for you to a discussion of Israel. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. The ancestors are there, and from them, by physical descent, came the Christ, who is God over all, praise forever. Amen. Paul is dealing with this tension, which for him is not a theoretical discussion. His people had all of God's promises, and now they're on the outside. Paul, you just said God will never stop loving me. Well, what about Israel? What about God's promises to Israel? What's the story there? How can I trust God to be faithful to his promises if I've got a whole book worth of promises to Israel that God doesn't intend to keep? And so there's a real challenge. Verses 1 to 3 express Paul's anguish for his people. He just said that nothing can separate from the love of God, and now he says that Israel is on the outs with God. How can we trust God with our own promises if his past promises, in this case those promises made to Israel, need qualification? Didn't he promise Israel something much like we find in Romans 8? Here's an example, Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. But sometimes circumstances change. I suppose that's what happened with Israel. What if this happens in our experience? Will God be able to keep his promises? The benefits of Israel that Paul lists here, adoption, glory, covenants, the law, worship, promises, all things God has put in place to prepare for the coming Messiah. 
And not surprisingly then, they sound, in most cases, like our benefits. The benefits that we have in the Messiah, in Christ. Verse 5, the messianic trajectory of the promises comes into sharpest focus when we consider the patriarchs, those who are their ancestors by physical descent. From them, at least in physical terms, comes the Messiah, who, by the way, is the eternal God. So can you imagine Paul's heartache at the rejection of this message by his own people? This isn't theoretical for him. Those he loves haven't turned to Jesus. And now he goes to Rome. And there he finds people, and he tells them that he's come from Jerusalem to report that the scriptures are fulfilled and the Messiah has come to his people. The Messiah has come. And they reply, oh, amazing. Are the people forming an army to get rid of the enemy? No, not really. Well, at least surely the religious leaders have rallied around. What about them? Well, they killed them. Your news is that they killed the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised? Paul, you're not making sense. And so it goes. But if Israel rejected God and God rejected Israel, doesn't that mean that God isn't keeping his great promises? These verses show that God has kept his promises. The Messiah has come. He has offered them life. In that sense, God has been faithful to his promises. But what about his promises to the people that he would save Israel through the Messiah? This is what Paul takes up in this section. So verses 1 to 5 rehearse those great promises to Israel. In verse six to thir- verses 6 to 13, we find that God's word stands through divine selection. We read about God's word and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The first thing that Paul says, it's not as though the word of God has failed, because all who are descended from Israel, sorry, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Neither are all of Abraham's children his descendants. Not as though God's word had failed. What what word? Well, in one sense, it's the entire story, including all the promises made to the nation along the way. But within Romans, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Has that word failed? The whole book of Romans is a defense of God's dealings with humanity. Can God keep his promises and still be well, the righteous judge of sinners. Can he justify the ungodly and still be truthful? Can he be righteous while showing mercy? And so in these verses, Paul addresses the question of how the elect, as he calls them, can be unsaved without eroding our confidence in the promises of God. Verse 6 asserts the truth that God's word has not failed. Then Paul goes on to prove it. The rest of verse 6 is the topic sentence for verses 7 to 13. Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. And here's the argument for why God's word has not failed. Not all who have descended from Israel are Israel. Now, at first, that might sound a bit slippery. Depends on what the meaning of is is. But Paul has the scriptures on his side. Abraham had sons through Hagar and Sarah, and then six more through Keturah. But the half-brothers are not children of the promise. And no sensible reader of the Old Testament would argue that they were. Verse 9 specifies a reduced line of descent that must, make no mistake about this, go through Sarah, not through Hagar, not through Keturah. And only the birth of Isaac satisfies the conditions of this great promise. So already the majority of Abraham's children are not the Israel of promise. One son is, seven are not. And if you think that excluding half-brothers is making too fine a distinction, then, uh, well, take a look at Isaac and Rebekah and their family. Now we're speaking not of half-brothers, but of twins. And like verse 9 Um, quotes God's word spoken to Abraham. Now we hear God speaking to Rebekah. The older will serve the younger. Okay, this is probably old and familiar to you and not particularly confronting. But what about the next thing Paul claims? uh, Yeah, Paul writes about these twins that God says about these twins. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. 
When you proclaim the gospel, do you say God loves you or even God loves everybody? I know of at least one person God didn't love. And there may be more. Paul's point here is that even after that whittling down took place in Abraham's immediate family, the Israel of promise, the one loved by God, it still gets smaller. Paul isn't redefining Israel as something that is, um, let's say, more than Abraham's descendants in order to smuggle the Gentile church into his definition of Israel. What he's saying is that it has always been properly defined as much less than the physical descendants of Abraham. At some point, it almost begins to feel as only a remnant of Israel will remain. And what should we do with God's hatred? Well, that's what verses 14 to 18 address. God's justice, verses 14 to 18, shines through his mercy and his hardening. How can God be just in a context of love and hate, of choosing one over another? Excuse me. Verse 15. I have to admit I'm straining to see this uh, text. Uh, For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The beginning of an answer lies in what God told Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. I will have mercy on whom I want to have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I want to have mercy. Now this passage comes immediately after the incident with the golden calf. You and I know that all the people deserve destruction, but God asserts his divine authority to show mercy. Well, how can that be just and right? We think the problem is that God hated Esau. The real challenge, the question that Paul has to wrestle with, is how can God love Jacob? That's hardly just. After all, it was, well, let's see what it says. Before he'd done anything, good or bad. It was before birth and before Jacob does anything good. And if you read the Bible's account of Jacob, you might conclude that Jacob never does anything good. But God shows him unmerited favor. Now, Paul has in Romans been arguing that God, by faith, justifies the ungodly. That's a word of hope, that God justifies the ungodly. God saves sinners Why does God, according to Romans 3.25, present Christ as an atoning sacrifice? The answer, to demonstrate his righteousness. That is, he does it to show, according to 3.26, something rather difficult to hold together. Namely, that he is both just and the justifier. Is God unjust? No, he's sovereign and he is free. And if he wants to, he can show mercy and have compassion. In a move that runs very much against the assumptions of Western culture, Paul accepts that the burden of proof isn't on those defending judgment and condemnation. It's on those defending God's mercy, compassion, grace, and love. And yet we see Abraham, Jacob, and others as the objects of God's affection. Not because they deserve it, but because God has chosen to love them. Verse 16 So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. Uh, This reminds us of previous arguments in Romans about not working, but finding grace. Verse 17, for the scriptures tell, scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason so that I might display my power in you and that my name may be proclaimed in the whole earth. Paul says, hey, let's think about Pharaoh for a minute. He was raised up so that in him God might display his own power and so that God's name would be proclaimed throughout the earth. He didn't receive mercy, but God's purposes were fulfilled. So why did God choose Israel? The best short answer that I can think of is so that God may display his power and so that his name would be proclaimed in all the earth. The same reason that God didn't choose Pharaoh, the same reason God hardened Pharaoh, is the reason why he chose Israel, so that he would display his power and his name would be proclaimed. It didn't lead to salvation for Pharaoh, and it didn't lead to salvation for all of Israel, but it did lead to the fulfillment of God's purposes. 
So why did God choose you? The obvious answer, I think, is so that he might display his power and so that we may make our own tiny contribution to his name being proclaimed in all the earth. You might have more in common with Pharaoh than you realize, even if there are some incredible differences. So God freely loves and hates. God freely shows mercy and hardens, and we thank him for his kindness in choosing us and bringing us to salvation. Romans 9, verse 18, so then he shows mercy to those he wants to, and he hardens those he wants to harden. But hang on a second. Verse 19, you'll say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? How can you blame me if I have no say in the matter, if I have no choice, if I have no freedom? At this point, it's not a merely philosophical conversation for Paul. He answers not in terms of uh, our modern debates about these things, but rather in terms of who God is. Who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Okay, first response to, that's not fair. Who are you to tell God what's fair? He expands that just a bit. Will what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And of course, the answer is yes. Sometimes you do something with pottery. I'm I'm making assumptions here, never having done anything with pottery. You might make something really nice that you put in your kitchen. And in the first century world, you might make something that's pretty nice when you make it, but it is the ancient equivalent of a toilet. And the clay doesn't have any say in which it's going to be. It doesn't speak back to the potter and say, hey, I want to be something different. It just accepts reality. That is the reality with this. And, well, has the potter no right over the clay? Of course, the potter has absolute right to do what he wants or she wants with the clay, to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor. And what if God, desiring to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience, objects of wrath ready for destruction, And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? On us, the ones he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles, as he also says in Hosea. So the thing that struck me as I read this, the thing that stood out for me is in verse 22. What if God, desiring to display his wrath, I want to stop for a moment. I don't know if that interests you, but it certainly interests me. You mean God is angry? And he wants you to know that he's angry. He wants the world to know that he's angry. I don't know what the preaching is like here, but where I go to church, there's not a lot of talk about that. God wants people to know that he's angry. With with what? Well, it's always been with sin. And if he's angry with sin, then the worry has to be that he's angry with sinners. God wants this to be known. But the other side of that is making his power known. There again, that power and glory that's tied up in that. God patiently deals with those who are objects of wrath, who are ready for destruction. And verse 23, on the flip side, what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory? God endured. God displays his wrath. Why? So that we see the riches of his glory on objects of mercy. As long as we're objects of mercy, that understanding of mercy will be multiplied, amplified, if we understand that what we really are owed is wrath. Destruction. And yet that's not what we receive. We receive mercy. How glorious is this God? the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory. So he says, there's wrath to show God's glory and there's mercy to show your glory. Or at least to show you glory. You are prepared beforehand for glory. And I think it means not just God's glory, but you participate in glory. You become in God's sight something glorious. You've been made for glory. So God's wrath shows his glory and God's mercy shows our glory. 
And some days I look in the mirror and I don't see any glory. But this is God's mercy at work in the lives of those who call upon him. What a wonderful God he is. Um, he says, let's bring Hosea into the discussion. Because he's just talked about not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Before I move on, I suppose I should observe that when it says he's um, prepared some for glory, not only from the Jews, that means there are some from the Jews who are prepared for glory. There's a word of hope there. There's a forward-looking statement that's being made, but also from the Gentiles, and of course Gentiles simply means for Paul, those who aren't Jews. So um, there's a coming together of Jews and Gentiles around this notion of glory, at least some Jews and some Gentiles. As he also says in Hosea, I will call not my people, my people. And she who is unloved, beloved. It's that great reversal that we find in the promises and the outworking of God's glory and grace. The reversal of those who are not my people will become my people. Those who are unloved will become beloved. And it will be in the place where they were told, you are not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. And I see that there are women in the room. So I think it's worth saying, the word son is not solely about maleness in this type of statement. It's about relationship. The son is the heir in the home, in the um, family unit, the one who gets the promises. And so I would say male and female, we who were not God's people have become God's people so that we have the privilege of the household, the household of the living God. I think that's a beautiful thing. But Israel, sorry, but Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. So that's the not people who have become the heirs to God. But on the other hand, there's Israel. And I thought, hey, they were the heirs of God, weren't they? They are the heirs of God, aren't they? But this is what Isaiah says by the mouth of two, of two or three witnesses. Though the number of Israel's sons is like the sand of the sea, there again the word son, is like the sand of the sea, uh, that is innumerable, uncountable, Unimaginable, only the remnant will be saved. We're whittling down again. Why so few? Because Isaiah says only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will execute his sentence completely and decisively on the earth. This is God's plan and God's purposes being worked out. And it's a whittling down, not because God is unfaithful to his promises, but because he's always dealt with that, that choosing remnant reality. Jacob, Isaac, Abraham. And just as Isaiah predicted, verse 29, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. That is, we'd be zero. There'd be not one left if not for God having left this, um, this remnant, this small group, which he calls offspring. So the Old Testament, which contains all God's great promises to Israel, also talked about this whittling down, this narrowing, this restriction, this reduction, until it's just about zero, or so it appears. Chapter 11 says, not quite, but there is that reduction. So what should we say then? Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness have obtained righteousness. That's, in a sense, to sum things up, that's Paul's word for salvation. That's what it's on view here. Gentiles didn't chase after it, but they found a right standing with God that results in salvation, namely the righteousness that comes through faith. Those early chapters of Romans say everybody's under sin, so we need a solution. Chapter 4 turns and says it's faith. It's faith in Christ. The Messiah has come. Do you accept this Messiah? Israel Pursuing the law for righteousness has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why is that? Because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. So there are two ways to read all that stuff that Moses wrote down as legal code. One way is to say, if you do these things, you'll be saved by doing them, by the doing of them. And another way is to say that the whole book the whole thing that Moses wrote was actually a lesson on faith. 
Most Jews read it as something that they have to do. And in fact, they did have to do those laws. That's the way laws work. But the argument that they're in is a bit bigger and broader than that. Uh, when I read those first five books of Moses, I find that there are two men who are primary. One is Abraham, and the other is Moses. And when I read about Abraham, I discover that there's some problems in Abraham's life, especially with the way he lies about his wife and so on. There are these issues, but he's a man of faith. Abraham is presented as the man of faith, and he gets to go into land. God calls him to come into land. He gets to go. He explores it. He goes in and out, repeatedly, in and out. That's freedom. And Moses, the man of the law, he gets to peer into the land from a distance. That's as close as the law will ever get you. Abraham, the free man of faith, is the one who gets to go in. The law doesn't do it for you. The law is holy, just, and good, Paul can write, but it's not a vehicle of salvation. And Israel got caught up with respect to the law in the wrong way. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, and now we're back to Isaiah chapter 28. Look, I am putting a stone in Zion to stumble over and a rock to trip over. That's God's plan again. That's intentional. It's not accidental that this rock is there. God has planned things this way. Yet the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. And we know from reading the New Testament that this rock is Jesus. He's the one that Israel stumbles over, but the one who believes in him will not be on the out, will not be disgraced, will not lose that relationship. The one who believes on him. So Moses, you could say for five books, is preaching the reality of faith with Abraham, the one who gets into the land. And Isaiah complements that with another statement about the reality of faith. It's about believing in the one God has sent to bring salvation. And if you believe in the one God sent for salvation, you will have salvation. You will not be put to shame. So, Romans chapter 9, faith versus the law. Is God faithful to his promises? Well, the promises aren't exactly what we think they are when it comes to Israel. There's always been that reduction. And... It's always been about faith. The message of the Old Testament, the message of the New Testament, is a message of faith. That's something for us to buy into, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I'd have enough room for notes, but I actually need a second page. Uh, I don't know about you guys. There was a lot there, Philip. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I want to give us five minutes, just five minutes, uh, to just process some of the stuff that we've just heard. Uh, you might do that by talking with someone nearby or writing down something on the bottom of page four. Uh, and then after five minutes, uh, Philip's going to be willing to answer briefly any questions we might have. All righty, brothers and sisters, uh, that's given you five minutes or so to have a chin wag. Uh, any questions uh, for Philip? Uh, I, I'll, I'll repeat the questions so that we can hear them on the recording, and then Philip will answer them. Baxter, what's your question? Um, so, if it is as you say that God create, raises up one person for judgment to display his glory, and another person so the question is and this is for the recording if someone is created to display God's glory in judgment and someone's created to display God's glory and their glory in salvation where is my assurance of who I am between those two. There's about three long questions in that, or at least three long answers that go with that. I don't think anybody's going to show up in heaven and say, I'm here, I'm elect, let me in. Um, so if that's not the way it works, 
what is the basis for your assurance, for anybody's assurance? And I would say, you, first of all, do you look to the finished work of Christ on your behalf? Uh, the Christian is the one who looks to the cross and looks to Jesus as Savior. How do I know um, that Jesus' um, um, death has worked for me, that his resurrection has worked for me? At that point, I'm going to uh, uh, look at um, a number of things, and one of them will be, is the Spirit at work in my life? So again, that has its own set of problems. Uh, when you look at the New Testament, and this is going to have all sorts of problems, when you look at the Scriptures, consistently it talks about judgment, and it consistently talks about people's works being assessed. So um, here's the analogy I use. I said 40 years ago, I do. Um, did that make any difference in my relationship with, with my wife? Um, she would, if it never did, she'd be entitled to say, you, you got to be joking, this isn't a marriage. Um, it's not just that I went forward in church and said something. The next 40 years, I lived that out. If you come to me and say, I'm going to heaven because yeah, I know my life isn't what it should be, but I went forward in church and I said something. I even filled out a card, so I'm going to heaven. Well, I'm going to have some probing questions at that point. Now, all that I'm saying has the danger of undermining your assurance, and I don't want to do that, but I want to say that God is a serious being and in some ways a fearsome God who is angry with sin. And so we don't take these things lightly. There are times when people will come up to me and say, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. And I'm going to say, well, I'm pretty sure you're not. Um, do we have time for this? I don't know. Well, we, we, we had a student who was playing professional rugby. Football, do you call it? I don't know. And uh, he went, he's an Islander, so he went up to his teammate who was an outspoken known Christian at that time, and, and he kind of sheepishly said, you know, I'm a Christian too. And the man looked at him and said, you're going to hell. And that was the word that got this man on a different track, and he's living a different life. He's now in ministry because somebody had the courage to say, you're going to hell. Because he looked at the way he was living and said, no, that's not consistent with Christianity. So, sorry, there are too many things that just went into that for that to make sense, but hopefully there's something. Uh, thankfully, he's staying at our place. You can bail him up later. Um, Philip. Uh, it seems to me that justice, God's justice, as the great and that it is so far removed from our idea of justice in the world. Yeah. How will we cope with that? Uh, so the question is, the concept of justice in the passage we've just looked at is very different to the concept of justice that permeates the world. How are we to talk to people in our world about justice if we're talking about two different things? God's justice is defined by the fact that everybody's guilty and deserving of punishment. God's mercy is defined by the fact that he um, speaks generously and warmly to, to, to those who trust in him. Um, I'm not sure that we can have a, a human justice system that's based on God's ways of justice. And when you read the scriptures, then it talks about what human justice can look like. And it doesn't line up entirely with God's ways. And I would say at some level it's a reflection of God's character, but it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, so that means it's, it can be very difficult to talk about our ways of justice. Um, I treat my children in a way different from the way the state treats my children, and that's appropriate. And God treats us differently from the way we treat our children sometimes and from the way the state treats our children. One more question, if anyone's got one. Oh, Phil's got another one. All right, we'll, we'll finish with this one, and then we've got morning tea and lunch. Are you coming to the bush dance? Like you, you were talking about whether or not you might, but you'll certainly need dinner tonight, won't you? I yeah, so. So, so there'll be dinner tonight as well. Uh, Phil, next question. Yeah, if we have loved ones who are apparently objects of wrong, yeah. how are we best to get to that? Uh, if we have loved ones who are apparently objects of wrath, how are we meant to deal with that? That's that's the pain and reality of life, isn't it? Um, I think our perspective is so different. So for Paul, he's going into a world where the assumption is nobody's a Christian. Okay, I, I know in Jerusalem there's this church that's thriving, but 
Everywhere I go, there are no Christians. Um, you know, there might be a small number. And so he says, that means I need to tell them the gospel. So our perspective isn't that nobody's a Christian. It's that, you know, the world's sort of Christianized and our nation is sort of Christian and our families are Christian. So what about the individual who's not? For Paul, the, the assumption is nobody is. For us, it's we want everybody to be. So there's, there's a, a misalignment because of 2,000 years of Christian work. Um, and Paul's answer is, we've got to tell them. And look at the result. The church has grown. And what's our answer when we have loved ones? We've got to tell them. I think it's a little bit easier to, let's say, stand on a street corner and proclaim Jesus than to deal with the people in my own family who aren't following Jesus. And um, it's cost us um, significantly in terms of relationships when we've tried to share the gospel with people in our own families. Uh, so there's no easy answer except to say that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I would just encourage you to be wise. Don't overstep boundaries that you shouldn't step over and just keep loving well and pray, pray that God would do his great work. Uh, a lot there to digest and a lot to consider.